I will say also that the reaction to the evolutionary theories of religion is part of the reason why I think a lot of cultural anthropologists now are leery about making sort of bold claims about where religion started and where it came from, because we understand um, that there's a lot of limitations to what we can really say about what people were believing 500,000 years ago. Let's now talk about psychosocial approaches. Um, psychosocial approaches are still popular in the anthropology of religion. They're not the majority view, um, but there are still scholars that use this kind of approach. Um, I would say it's definitely a minority view, but it's there. And I think nowadays, um, it's actually a pretty solid set of theories that people use in interesting ways. I would say at the very start, um, as it was developed by Freud and other early psychologists, it was not very useful. Over time, it's gained in strength. Freud viewed religion fundamentally as an illusion rooted in psychological issues. Um, he saw religion as rooted in people's fear, such as fear of death or just fear more generally of just sort of the chaos of life. If we look at that, I'm not even sure I would disagree with him as somebody, I'm not a Freudian uh, and I myself am religious, but I could see the argument, right? People try to grapple with fear and a lot of times that they turn to sort of the supernatural as a way of grappling with that. So I, I think all of us could look at that and say, sure, that kind of makes sense, Freud. Um, Freud also tried to argue that religion, though, had a lot to do with people's father issues and specifically sort of their dissatisfaction with their father figures and therefore projection. So this tied in with a lot of Freud's other theories about how our subconscious mind works, that we project sort of a perfect father figure into the skies. And that's where we develop our ideas of God. Um, there's some issues with that, not the least of which is that not all religions view deities as father figures, and for that matter, not all religions even view them as parental figures, whether male or female, or any other gender. Um, and so that leads to some problems. If the deities aren't sort of father or mother figures, and then we're trying to say it's all projections from our dissatisfied home life, does that really still work? Hmm. Um, and then kind of a third part of how, so he had a few different ways that he tried to explain where religion had come from. Um, and this is where Freud's ideas to be blunt get really weird. I kind of think Freud should have stuck to psychology where he had some really good ideas and not tried to do anthropology slash history, but he did. <laughs> so we have ideas that he developed and theories that he developed about religion. So one of his ideas for where um, religion came from is what we call the promiscuous horde. Freud has this kind of theory slash story, where he says, well, early humans existed in these sort of um, extended family groupings where the elder male had all the power and controlled um, who, well, essentially he had a sexual monopoly in the sense of um, having sex with the women in the extended family group, and none of the rest of the males were allowed to. And then the other males were dissatisfied with this and killed the, the elder male. And then there was a promiscuous horde, quote unquote, where sort of everybody was having sex with everybody. Um, and then they saw that this was chaos. And so they also felt incredible guilt about what they had done to their father figure. And therefore they reinstituted the original sort of um, what we would now call the incest taboo rules about who you're allowed to have sex with that are in relation to each other. Um, and then they reinstituted the incest taboo and also set up a ceremony where they would consume small pieces of that elder male that they had killed, and that this became one of the first religious rituals. Now, it doesn't take a genius to see that what Freud uh, is sort of pointing to is that this would have been like kind of the early foundation of rituals such as communion or last Lord's Supper within the Christian tradition, uh, where people consume pieces of um, bread or other carbohydrates that are um, symbolic of or embodiments of uh, Jesus is flesh. But um, the problem with that is that many religions don't have a comparable ceremony to that. And if we're thinking from an anthropological perspective, rich, the ritual of communion or Lord's Supper is a relatively newcomer to religion compared to um, other religious traditions that came earlier. And so to try to sort of explain religion by explaining, well, here's where we got communion from, doesn't really work if communion is not one of the earliest forms of religiosity, which as far as we can tell, it is not, um, since Christianity doesn't really start until about 30 AD. Um, it's also another one of those just so stories in the sense that he sort of just made up a story and didn't really have any archeological evidence for it or anything. It also doesn't really make sense with, I would argue, how human psychology tends to work nowadays. 
And it also kind of doesn't match the data in the sense that we know that for a very, very long time, humans have had either their marriages or things that are very similar to our modern concept of marriage in the sense of some kind of rules about who's having sex with who. So we don't have like any evidence of a clear promiscuous horde um, period that like has direct archaeological evidence tied to it. So um, it's an interesting theory. I think it's not a good theory. <laughs> I think here's where Freud's probably on his surest footing. Here's where it starts to get a little shaky and kind of here's where it falls apart entirely. So these are a couple of memes I made to illustrate the point. Freud, I have a theory about where religion come from. Anthropology, Freud, is it sex? Freud, of course not. Anthropology, Freud, Freud, okay, it's sex. So Freud was not an anthropologist, but he influenced anthropologists with his theories about religion. And certainly there were a few anthropologists who kind of picked up on the, those themes and ran with them. And it's still part of sort of the legacy of social science theories about religion. So um, even though Freud's ideas of the incestuous horde are kind of nonsense, sorry, it's incestuous, not promiscuous, huh? Well, um, even though his ideas of that were kind of nonsense, and even though his ideas of sort of religion as projected father issues probably don't fully stand when you examine them closer, his overall idea, the psychological ideas, um, can powerfully shape religion. If we were to reframe what Freud said, and instead of making it these sort of hypotheses about what early humans were up to, and instead just say, hey, is part of the reason people turn to religion because of psychological issues, then our response would be definitely, right? Psychological, people's psychological issues, people's psychological makeup, their psychological character definitely influences religious, um, sort of what religion does for people as well as how people engage with religion. Um, and we have some good theorists nowadays that are doing interesting work in that regard. Tanya Lerman, who writes one of my favorite anthropology of religions, When God Talks Back, has done a lot of really interesting work since she's both trained as a psychologist and an anthropologist. Um, Dr. Lerman has found some really interesting connections, for example, between how different types of prayer postures, as far as like sitting up or kneeling down, can actually have sort of effects in the brain in terms of how you view things, sort of where you're psychologically at and therefore affect how you pray. As well as interesting research, for example, on um, Christian psychotherapists that provide psychotherapy to other Christians within a religious context and often have to sort of counsel um, other Christians through their father issues because that affects how they view God, who in the Christian tradition is often sort of the father in heaven, our father in heaven. And so the idea that psychology influences um, people's experience of their religion as well as the shapes of their religious experience and practice makes sense. And I think it's a really interesting and valuable form of research, as long as we don't, don't sort of try to oversell the point as Freud did. So was this, does this theory make sense? I would say Freud's original theory, incestuous horde and all that, no. <laughs> and it was not supported by the data. I'd say the bigger idea, psychology can influence people's religious experiences and religious ideas. Sure, definitely. People are affected by a lot of things and their psychology is definitely one of those. So does it teach us something useful? Yeah, it zeroes our attention in when we're trying to understand, for example, why do different people in a culture, this is a point Lerman talks about quite a bit, why do different people experience the same religion very differently? And for some people, it becomes a source of hope, and for other people, it becomes a source of, like, they become obsessed with the idea of evil spirits or something. Well, we have to look to psychology as part of that. And so taking a psychological approach to religion can be really helpful and useful. Um, let's now talk about the functionalist approach to religion. So um, associated with early scholars such as Emil Durkheim, the early sort of one of the fathers of sociology, uh, as well as people like Evans Pritchard, functionalism in a nutshell focuses on the idea of what does religion do in relation to society. And functionalists, generally speaking, felt that religion existed as with other types of widespread social institutions such as marriage, such as divisions of labor, that religion existed because it did something for society, right? By which I mean religion either helped societies survive, and that's why human societies have religion and why religion is proliferated across most human societies. Um, so it must somehow help societies survive or help the individuals within society survive or make sense of their world. So, for example, Malinowski, one functionalist, 
felt that beliefs in magic spells among Trobriand Islanders and presumably among other human groups had a lot to do with sort of psycho making sure humans could psychologically well function by giving them a way to feel like they had control over the most chaotic parts of their lives. In Malinovsky's example, um, he found that spells sort of proliferated among Trobriand Islanders. These are this is a New Guinean group when they were doing sort of deep sea fishing where things were very dangerous and they could die or at least not get a good catch. And so he felt that religion, and particularly magic, was a way of people sort of controlling their anxiety. So that's a functionalist explanation. Um, Durkheim had a very functionalist explanation, and you read from that, from his early, very influential book, Elementary Forms of Religious Life. Um, Durkheim in that book early on basically says, religion, the things that religion believes in don't exist. So he was very much coming from an atheist, or at least um, deeply skeptical towards the truth claims of religion. You know that this doesn't that we can't use gods to explain religions. We can't use divine beings to explain religions. But he also said we also can't do what Freud or the evolutionists tried to do and try to think back and try to figure out what the earliest humans were up to. It's impossible. We don't have the data for it. So he said instead of doing either of that, instead of trying to put it all at God's feet or put it all at the feet of early humans and try to figure out what they were thinking. Instead, we should try to understand why religion exists by thinking about the omnipresent causes, as he would call it, the ever-present causes of religion. Sort of instead of trying to say where it started, instead try to think through where it's always starting. Why do societies again and again and again develop religions? Why do societies tend to keep religions going? What does that do for a society? What is its function? So therefore, why do societies sort of invest in a religion? You see that with functionalists, they very much kind of view societies almost like an organism that keeps itself going. And although that's been widely critiqued later on, and many scholars have felt that that's very simplistic and that societies are very dysfunctional often, and that functionalist approach really tries to make them sound more harmonious and unified than they are, I do think there's a bit of value um, to a functionalist approach if what we mean is that... Um, people don't sort of invest in institutions for no reason at all, right? There's usually reasoning behind that of some sort. So Emil Durkheim, though, uh, in the reading that you did, shows a really good example of a functionalist approach to religion. So he, he didn't actually do ethnography in Australia. He was relying on two other ethnographers who had written a bunch of their reports, um, primarily. But he was studying a group of Aboriginal Australians who, like many Aboriginal Australian groups, uh, practiced rituals in connection to what we would now call the dream time or the dreaming. Um, dream time or dreaming is a set of beliefs found in many of the Aboriginal Australian groups. And I don't want to oversimplify because it is a philosophically complex and difficult to convey concept in English. Um, but to oversimplify, the idea here would be that there's a plane of existence that is sort of earlier than our plane of existence, or perhaps parallel to our plane of existence, but again, a different plane, wherein there are these ancestral beings, these beings that came before and from which uh, the contemporary Aboriginal groups are sort of descended, and that these ancestral beings, these divine beings, did various types of activities, slash are doing various types of activities around the sort of, shall we say, mythic or sacred landscape which then have manifestations in the present day Australian landscape. So for example, uh, these two rock pillars next to each other are two women sitting. They're two ancestral sort of deity figures that have sat down next to each other and therefore formed those rocks. Or this valley is the result of rainbow serpents sort of slithering around the Australian landscape. And so the dreaming is a very powerful concept within an Aboriginal Australian thought. Um, and there's a number of rituals associated with it. Durkheim didn't know a lot of that sort of background cosmology, so he doesn't get into it a lot, but he does look at the rituals themselves. And he notes the fact that Aboriginal Australian groups at the time, and to some degree still today, of course, um, that groups were associated with specific sort of icons that were, we would, that they were being called totems or totemism. Uh, so sort of, you would have kangaroo clan, you would have boomerang clan, you would have uh, snake clan, like clans that were associated with different sort of ancestral mythic beings or objects. And so he studied specifically Wawarunga, a group that was associated with snake, snake totem. And that was sort of the symbol of their group and the deity that meant the most to them that had to do with 
the specific um, landmarks that they lived close to. So one of, part of what the totemistics and um, Dreamtime belief system did for Aboriginal Australians for you know 50,000 years prior to the arrival of Europeans was allow for Australia, the continent, to be divided between different groups of people with a minimum of sort of need for A, a centralized government, or B, constant territorial fights. They were able to sort of divvy up the landscape based on, well, you're the snake people. The snake being originally had moved through this specific area and caused this manifestation, and therefore, and your people are, that's why your people are associated with this piece of land. So there was these sacred stories that connected people through their totem to specific pieces of land, and they did ceremonies that honored um, these totems. And do ceremonies that honor these totems. I don't mean to speak in the past tense, except for the fact that the ethnography Durkheim was drawing on is at this point about 120 years old. So I don't want to presume. Um, I don't want to make it sound like it looks the exact same now, but obviously a lot of these beliefs are very, and practicers are still very much in the present. Um, so Durkheim's point in looking, he looked at rituals that were done specifically within Rarunga, where like a huge hill, as you read about in the reading, big old dirt mound would be created and a snake icon put on top of it. And then people would dance around this mound for days and sort of have this very, what in the view of, um, the anthropologist was this very almost like frenzied air about them. Um, a lot of hollering, a lot of noise, a lot of singing, a lot of dancing, and it got very like ecstatic and hyper. And then people would eventually actually kind of at the peak of that uh, destroy this sort of mound of dirt with this symbol. And it was all this kind of celebration, but it wasn't a celebration that people, let's say, did every Sunday or something uh, or did all year. Instead, it was certain parts of the year. So Aboriginal Australian groups um, did not have centralized governments and instead were found in these kind of like um, these bands associated with certain areas out there hunting in the bush, living in the bush, um, and then would come together. Several like kind of extended family groups would come together to form a bigger clan for about half of the year and then take part in things like with these big kind of ecstatic religious ceremonies. So Durkheim is somebody that was really interested in social solidarity, what keeps human beings together, right? That was, for Durkheim, that's like one of his basic questions is, why do human beings not just go off into their own separate families? Why do we make society? Um, he, especially in a case like this, where the in, in immediate families were perfectly capable of hunting on their own, why did they choose to lump together? And he said, well, they choose to lump together be, partly because of these religious rituals uh, that bring them together. And that was a big part of actually what Durkheim thought these religious rituals were really about. To Durkheim, coming yet again from the perspective of a scholar who was deeply skeptical about the supernatural, he felt that the totems were not themselves powerful, that these ancestral beings didn't really exist, and the totems themselves were not like particularly inspiring. Like a snake, Aboriginal Australians see snakes all the time. That's not like some sort of particularly potent thing. But he said the symbols become powerful because of the rituals, and then he said, well, what are the rituals really about? What are the symbols really about? Um, and he's, the way he looked at it is that um, as people go through these rituals, they experience what he was calling social effervescence. So I, I like to illustrate this, and I can't do it because we're not live with each other. But I like to illustrate this in my class by having us all sing Bohemian Rhapsody, the Queen song together, which most people know, and then cutting it off at one point. And then everybody keeps singing for a few bars and they're able to do it together. And it's this like weird feeling of like we're collectively building something together. Um, so if you've ever been to a really like emotional concert or something, uh, you know this feeling, right? He's saying that people get caught up in a moment of unison all with each other. And in that moment of unison, they feel something beyond themselves. And that something that they feel beyond themselves is social unity, right? It's the unison of a group in harmony with each other but they sort of project that onto their totem since the totem is the symbol of the group. And so those are kind of mixed together in, in their minds, they're together. And so as he puts it, the totem then is the symbol of society. And if the totem is the symbol of the society, can we not say that the toad, that the society is the God, right? So he's basically saying that what people worship in that, in those um, dream time ceremonies are in fact, they're sort of honoring, venerating and worshiping the unity that they feel as a social group unified under this totem and under these ceremonies and at this specific time is very dramatically different from what they experience day to day. Um, in this regard, his view is people feel strong feelings towards society that manifest as sacred symbols. 
and those sacred symbols in turn unify people within society. So his argument would be that that is what the function of religion is, that the function of religion is to unify society. It brings people together and gives them this feeling of kind of holy togetherness, uh, which you may have experienced at times with your own faith communities if you come from a specific faith community. Um, you may even have experienced it in more secular ceremonies, such as a graduation. And so sort of this holy unity then becomes his explanation for where religion comes from. And he would argue, well, and this is why he calls them sort of the elementary forms of religious life. He feels like Aboriginal Australian religion is probably very similar to what early human religion was like. I don't know that that's really supported by any data, but that was his opinion because they were hunter-gatherer groups and are hunter-gatherer groups. And so he said, you know, other religions came later and developed further kind of directions from this, but they start with this core idea of honoring social unity and bringing societies together. So your religion's pretty basic, but it's really good at uniting people. So that's neat. As he puts it, these ideas are real. They're socially real, right? The, they really do bring people together. Um, now, that may be sound very, very cool to you or very, very offensive, depending on one's position. Um, it can come across incredibly condescending. And it, it, indeed, I think it's pretty obvious that Durkheim thought that the religion wasn't actually true in any sense other than that it had a social function to play. And in that regard, we can see it as quite condescending of Aboriginal Australian beliefs, and also very different from an Aboriginal, how an Aboriginal Australian person um, themselves might view their own beliefs. And so with that in mind, I'd like to go over to here. Actually, you know what? Last time I tried to play a video, I remember there were some issues with the sound coming, not coming through. So I'm going to actually just put that link on blackboard so you can watch it on your own but i strongly encourage you to watch it um and in fact watch it now like pause this video and go look at that link it's only a few minutes long and it's aboriginal australian people um doing their doing a ceremony a group of aboriginal australian people doing a ceremony in response to the catastrophic wildfires in 2019 um and in that they talk about a belief very similar to the one Dirk, or a pract a ritual very similar to the one durkheim describes but you'll notice some big differences, one of which is the supposed social frenzy that he was describing is not so frenetic as he was describing, a little more calm. Um, we would also say that they express their beliefs in terms of this is to honor our mother, the earth. Um, this is something that you feel a call to do because we're connected to our mother and connected to who we are as a people. So they do explain it in terms of identity and community, which is very in line with what Durkheim was saying. But they also say it phrase it in terms of a connectivity and a community that extends even to the entire earth and the entire ecology, which is a little bit bigger and perhaps more supernatural and religious than what Durkheim was explaining. So I don't think Durkheim's perspective was totally contrary to what they experienced with their religious ceremonies, but also perhaps a view that only got a slice of the pie, maybe a big slice of the pie, but only a slice of the pie of what they were experiencing in their ritual as they describe it very eloquently and awesomely in this video. Now, strengths and weaknesses of what Durkheim was saying. Do you, do you find yourself convinced by his theory using Aboriginal Australian data that all religion sort of originates from social unifying experiences? Um, I think there's a lot of support to it that one could bring out, and I think there's also a lot of anti-support to it um, in the way that he has phrased it. So um, his data would have been better if he'd actually gone and done research with the people and interviewed themselves for the meanings they find and not just sort of how the ritual is observed, right? Um, only knowing sort of how the ritual takes place only gives you one side of the equation. Um, think of if somebody tried to observe Catholic Mass with no understanding of Catholicism or Christianity more generally and never actually talked to a Catholic person about it, your view is going to be kind of one-sided. There's going to be things you pick up on and things you don't. Um, so there's that. I think, though, his idea that people experience Kind of a profound collectiveness within religion and that that's one of the reasons people turn to religion i think that's well substantiated and makes a lot of sense at the same time we do have some religious experiences which are deeply personal um deeply individualistic i'm thinking for example of a monk meditating a taoist um mystic uh, meditating off in the chinese wilderness as they were inclined to do during in the early days of taoism uh for perhaps months at a time that doesn't seem like social effervescence to me so maybe it doesn't need to, but it does beg the question, right? If we're trying to explain religion 
as this thing that exists because it's all about social unity? Why is it that in many religions they develop um, ascetic, mystical, individualist kind of things where you have monks or mystics or prophets sort of off in the wilderness having their own divine experiences for long periods of time? It's kind of an interesting question to go back and forth on. Functionalism as a whole has become rather unpopular over time in anthropology, in part because we've come to see that society isn't really perfectly unified and not all things serve a nice little function. There are parts of society that are just oppressive and there's a lot of violence and jockeying for power um, and more conflict in society than perhaps early anthropologists recognized. Um, at the same time, the bigger idea, oh, it's kind of like with Freud, even if Freud's specific ideas were disproven, his bigger point, the psychology affects religion, still holds true. And I would say Durkheim's bigger point, that religion affects and is affected by social relationships, I think that still totally holds true and is an influential way of thinking about religion and one that we still use in anthropology. The idea of let's understand religion not just as sort of statements about the divine world, but also statements about our human social world, right? People use religion as a way to talk about their social groups promote social cohesion, to come together as a people, to express an identity. Um, and in that regard, you could think of recent, more recent scholarships such as Women of the Forest by Linda and Robert Murphy. Um, and it, we'll talk about it more later in the semester, but among the Yanomamo group in the Amazon, uh, you have a religion that very much puts the men in power over the women. Now, that's an anti-functionalist argument in the sense that this isn't some like, you know, good harmony. If anything, it's this like exploitive relationship. At the same time, it is sort of a functionalist argument in the sense that it's saying that religion does something in terms of the social relationships in a society that may not promote social cohesion so much as social hierarchy, though. So that's where we don't want to be simplistic like a lot of the early functionalists were, but we do want to acknowledge that religion affects social relationships. And that's one of the key findings of an anthropology of religion is that we're not just talking about the supernatural. We're talking about the social right here on the ground, right? Religion affects and is a way that people talk about the social events in their lives and the social situations. So does functionalism make sense as a theory? Sometimes, depending on the situation, I uh, probably wouldn't call it functionalism anymore because that's very, a simplistic theory, but the bigger idea I still think makes some sense. And is it supported by the data? Again, sometimes I think Durkheim's was partially supported by the data. Does it teach us something useful? Definitely. The idea that um, social relationships are manifest in and part of how people view the supernatural, I think, is huge. Uh, the fact that we often view the supernatural in terms of family terms, I think, is another example of that. And that doesn't mean that we have to agree with Durkheim that that's the origin of religion, that it comes from people's social experience. But the fact that social experience does often match with supernatural experiences suggests that there is some kind of connection there. We don't have to say that the chicken came before the egg or the egg came before the chicken. Maybe it's more that people pattern society off the supernatural. There's some kind of back and forth or dynamic going on there.